afternoon, everyone. My name is Genevieve, and I am a senior here at the Crane School of Music studying percussion. And this is my presentation on contemporary and experimental percussion works. Um, the piece that I just performed for in front of you was Scratch. Um, but just how I got into this type of music was because once in sophomore year, I had the opportunity to go to a percussion symposium up at the uh, McGill University up in Montreal. And they performed, they did not perform this piece in particular, but they did a lot of these type of theatrical presentations. Um, one of the pieces that we will be playing today was performed there. It was really interesting just to see the, a different side of percussion that we really don't have the opportunity to get here at Crane, which is more just classically based. Uh, so this type of music I find really interesting because it's Maybe you might not d determine that a balloon is a musical instrument, but today I just was able to show you a wealth of sounds that you could get out of a balloon. So maybe it is music, maybe it's not, and that's kind of what this presentation is all about. So tackling this piece, Scratch by Rolf Wallen, is really interesting. Um, Rolf is a composer in Norway, and the piece is not transcribed at all. It is all um, passed down orally by tradition. So there's no way to actually be able to perform this piece unless you talk to the composer himself. Um, so I had to actually Skype with Rolf over the past couple weeks to learn the process of the piece, learn how to um, perform it, and honestly the different techniques that you can get out of playing a balloon. If everyone here is probably familiar that balloons, you can get really scratchy and annoying sounds out of it, but to be able to do a prolonged ex performance, you need to you know, test out soapy water, how much soap you need in there, how big you need the balloons. I actually had to purchase specific balloons for this piece because the balloons that we have at Walmart are, will not stand up to something like this. And even as you noticed, it popped, um, which is because you're putting so much stress on the balloon. Um, it was really cool to be able to have this experience. I don't think a lot of us have the opportunity to actually meet with a composer, especially if they're not from uh, the US, just because of their accessibility, which now having technology allows us to do that. But it was really cool just to hear his passion for this piece and be able to show it myself as the performer on stage. Um, what's really cool is that this is very, it is, even if you might not deem it as music, it is still a somewhat of a performance. If you observe, you know, the tension of the possibility that the balloon could pop at any moment during the piece definitely heightens your awareness to pay attention to what's on stage. Um, definitely having a knife near a balloon also probably makes you a little nervous. So that was just my take on the piece. I really enjoyed having to practice making an inst a, what we would deem as not an instrument become virtuosic and it's, you know, being a percussionist, I'm used to that type of having to find more music out of a sound rather than a tone, but, you know, anyone could purchase balloons, anyone could learn this piece as long as they have the right mindset to put into learning um, this repertoire by Rolf Wallen. So that the picture on the left is him, um, Rolf, and the picture on the right is another person compose, uh, performing the piece. So usually, you know, it is if you watch other performances, it does go through the same motions. It's not improvised. It's just the the progression of the piece is what he um, is really what you're learning, not so much the sounds that you're making. So, to move on to another more traditional piece, um, we're going to have some performers come up and do John Cage's living room music. Um, this piece was composed in 1940 by John Cage. If you're not familiar with him, he's a avant-garde composer. Um, and to really bring up the sense is that that percussion is not, does not have to be always performed by a percussionist. If you are having some of these non-traditional elements, I decided to ask a few of my colleagues to um, take the opportunity to get to perform a percussion work as being non-percussionist, and today they actually will be percussionists. So I'd like to invite my eight performers up on stage.
Once upon a time, a time, a once upon a time, a once upon a time, a time, a time, a once upon a time, once upon a time, once upon a time, a once upon a time, once upon a time, upon a time, upon a time, a time upon a time, upon a
Thank you. So um, that was John Cage's living room music, um, all four movements of the piece. Um, so as I said before, John Cage is a very avant-garde composer. He usually questioned what music was and what we could constitute sound as, whether sound or silence could be still music, whether we could ever achieve absolute silence. And this piece is not as, um, it's not as questioning as most of the other ones, but he did kind of question what we could use as instruments, what we could make music out of. It was really interesting as on the directions to perform the piece, there is not an, any specified instruments for this. The performers are up, it's up to them to choose what objects they want to use, keeping in mind the pitch uh, in relation to the what we would call the soprano being the first player to the bass, which would be the fourth player. And that even the melody, which we did have performed on bassoon today, it could be performed on any type of melodic instrument as long as it was not voice. So it was really interesting to allow the performer to be able to choose the sounds that they want, to choose the tones that they are trying to get for the composition. Most of us, if we had a traditional, maybe a piano piece, you want just certain tones that come out of the piano. So here, really, you're pretty limitless in the options that you can come up with. Now, it does ask for household objects, so you would think, you know, in a living room, which hopefully the setup, as homey as it can be in Snell Theater, would look like a living room. Uh, for the second and the fourth, third movement, it kind of moved away from the traditional, you know, playing right, left, right, left with your hands. Um, the second one was story, which you were able to, obviously they were telling a story uh, using words in a rhythmic pattern. They were reading just from a short quote uh, by Gertrude Stein, uh, once upon a time the world was round and you could go on it around and around. And he was able to take those words and incorporate them into a rhythmic piece, which I think is actually really interesting, uh, especially in the in the piece, it tells you, instead of having specific pitches that you might have in a vocal piece, it tells you where the direction of the pitch you want. So the, whenever they were saying world, they would have the option to go world, you know, having a downward swoop, or to go down and come up, world. And it was up to the performer to decide what pitch they want to start on, how far the swoop is. It's just, it's more, you, it's more left to interpretation at that point for this type of music. Same with melody, we had the optional melody, so if you wanted to perform this movement, you did not actually have to include the melody, but I thought it was really uh, nice to have the bassoon playing with some percussion in there. The first and the last movement, uh, begin and end, to begin, sorry, and end, were very just traditional percussive sounds, and I told them to, you know, get, they had the options, I tried to leave it as much to the performers to get sounds that they wanted out of their from whatever they could find in their living room. And they were asking me, you know, does this sound good? You know, what do you think? And it's, you know, as a percussionist, I'm used to having to decide what type of sounds that I want. But, you know, to have people who are not used to percussion just opening their ears to what they can make about and uh, of sounds around them on just everyday objects, I think it was a really cool opportunity. And again, this piece, as long as you have some musical training of what eighth notes are and a little bit of polyrhythms and dynamics, it's accessible to anyone. They just have to be willing to put in the time for it. Um, I will now be moving on to a piece called To the Earth, which is sat right in front of me, so I will talk about it after.
that walk upon the holy ground and those that swim in the sea. And those that fly. All these are nursed. Yeah. 
Hail to you. Mother of Love. You who are loved by the starry sky. Be generous and give me a happy life. in return for my song. To that, I can continue to praise you with my music. So I had the opportunity to see this piece um, performed at the symposium, and it was kind of, it was a really interesting experience to watch someone um, perform. I've never seen anyone perform cross-legged. Really, if you think about it, a lot of percussion is you're at a chair or you're standing. So to have someone just sitting on the floor playing percussion, it was kind of a more intimate setting, I think, than what we're used to most pieces. Uh, just talking about the text of this piece, it's set in a Homeric hymn, so if you're familiar with the, uh, the Homer, the guy who wrote the Odyssey and the Iliad, a lot of his words are very, his text is very worldly and he has a huge, he goes into depth about things that he's talking about, and so a lot of the text in this is set, you know, to talk it's called to the earth. You're talking about Mother Earth and how our relationship with the earth as a, as a person, as an entity, rather than just thinking of a, a, a rock that we're living on, that you know we have to, as humans, have to give ourselves to Mother Earth, and in return, she will give things to us. And just to listen to the text on its own and then set it to music, it's interesting to just think about the objects that... Um, Frederick picked for this piece. If we look at the just the first page, it's to be played with knitting needles or thin sticks, but knitting needles on clay flower pots. So most music is not written for flower pots. I don't think there's really a repertoire built for that instrument. Um, so to have him decide that this is the sound that he was going for for this piece and even just to look at it too is that there's actual specific pitches that you're supposed to pick out for this piece. I had to go to Walmart and pick up the knitting needles that I have here, grab those first and then go and sit and hit flower pots to find as close as it says, as close to the pitches as you can find. So obviously I think they thought it was a little strange, you know, tuning flower pots, but to get that kind of melody out of what we would see as an inanimate object. Now, my idea is, you know, talking about Earth, we usually see a flower pot as you would grow life, and that could be the symbolization. But really, you know, if he wanted specific notes, what's to say that you couldn't just perform this on a marimba? What's to say you couldn't get four blocks of wood and perform this? So what was really the reasoning as to why we wanted, he wanted to use flower pots, why he wanted to use specific pitches, you know, we could only ask the composer, but it's just an interesting thing to think about is getting a melody out of four of the same object. The, what's really cool too is that you do have some of those melodic bits in the piece. If you've noticed, a lot of the text was set to be spoken 
at the same time as the rhythms played on the flower pots and from watching performances and looking up you know the the piece you i could have read it as very strict to the rhythm and have really broken uh, speech patterns which would fit exactly with what the music says or would be able to talk on my own as I'm playing, which is actually a little bit harder to try and talk, but playing rhythmically, but talking normally. It's something that we don't really have to think, we don't really think about because we're usually not talking and playing at the same time, which also brings up another thing is that percussion, we don't need to, we don't have to put an instrument in our mouths. We have our voice now as an option to be played with percussion. And I think it does resonate a lot more when we have the ability to vocalize either sounds or actual text because then it adds context because I think watching my me play flower pots for a couple minutes might get a little tedious but to have words and to be waiting to hear what the next thing is to kind of have the sense of this urgency that you know we need to respect the planet it kind of changes the aura of the piece that is being performed. Um, the next piece that is going to be performed is in French, music de table. I can't speak French. In English, it is table music. Um, so we're going to be performing table music for you guys.
So if any of you guys were here at the master class that was at 11.30, um, Austin LaMarche gave a presentation, was able to perform um, Silence Must Be, which is also by um, Terry DeMay. And if you saw the do do da 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 whatever the, one of the patterns that we all do in there, it is used in his other piece of music. So what's really interesting about this is this is more on that theatrical percussion side. It's a very visual aspect. You are getting a lot of you know, tr traditional 16th notes, 8th notes, rhythms. The rhythms are not so complex, but it's really the motion that you are doing with the piece. So in the front of all of our books, we have this basically chart that tells us what each of the notes are supposed to be, what the tones are. So the, some of them have, you know, like the arrow is supposed to be the back of our hand hitting the wood. We have a, a square that's supposed to be the side of our hand. We have a difference between playing a fist with our pinky on the table as opposed to our knuckles on the table. So it's just the different types of sounds that you could just get out of a block of wood. And now we did have the sound out, um, amplified through microphones, but just you'd still be able to hear the difference between the scraping or the tapping on the, on the wood. And I think it's really interesting that to come, you know, to tell someone to make a piece by just tapping on a table, it would, all the ideas that um, Demay came up with to compose this piece I think is really cool. Just to look at a little bit of the notation that he used. This is like any other traditional piece of music. He used, um, he took ideas and he transplant, he put it into each part, you know, in like a layering form or a canon. There's a lot of times where we were all together, two of us were together, uh, we were layered, you know, one after the other. Um, the middle person is usually the soloist as the two on the outside are playing. And it's just to see the, how the layout of the music is with notation and the, it's not a traditional staff by any means. You know, the top is supposed to be the right hand, the bottom is supposed to be the left hand, and then you just go in between trying to figure out, sometimes you're moving both your hands, sometimes you're moving only one. And it was more of just a choreography at this point, which if you've ever tried to look at percussion music, whenever you have more than one instrument, you basically are choreographing where your hands are going, where your arms are going to play the pieces. So it's really interesting to have it all built into a small little confined space of a table. What was the coolest part I think about this piece is that the rondo section and it came back in the beginning of the piece as well. If you were to look at this and have no context, I don't think we would really know what swirly lines would mean. It's not really a traditional sense. So the idea is that he had to explain in the piece that these swirls are supposed to be us doing these infinity swooping signs. And the, the thought that we've never had to think about 3D space as part of music 
I mean, we have the rhythm of when we're supposed to change, and that rhythm is is played when we hit the when we hit the actual piece of wood. But all of that space in between with the swooping is very. It's this th 3D space that we usually don't have to deal with in music. Usually, it's just notes on a page and we're moving fingers. But to think of how we're moving through time again, it's this choreography aspect that we really percussion usually has to do, and is you know it's an interesting. Um, you don't really get to see it in a lot of music, and I think this is a really cool example of having to use your, the space around you as opposed to just the instrument in front of you. So before I finish with the last piece, um, I felt that it would be better to end with the piece than for me to talk. So I just want to go into the last piece, which I'll be forming um, on the gong. So James Tenney is also a composer um, around the time of John Cage. He actually studied with John Cage, so a lot of his music is influenced by John Cage and the idea, again, of the existential, what is music, what is sound, can any sound be music. So just a context of his music, he wrote a collection of pieces, they're called postal pieces, and they were pieces that were written on postcards he composed for his friends and then just put a stamp on the back and sent it off to his friend. Which now, you know, we have email, we have texting, but to think, to, you just compose a piece of music on a postcard about this big, send it off, and now your friend, you've commissioned to work from them. So he did a lot of works besides percussion, um, just swell piece is an example. Uh, if you can't read it, it says to be performed by any number of instruments beyond three and lasting any length of time previous, previously agreed upon. So he leaves the interpretation of the piece to be to the performers. You could have as many people as you want to perform it. You could play it for as long as you want. And just like the title swell, it is really that the players are playing one tone. They're not supposed to change timbre or pitch. It's supposed to stay as consistent as possible with building intensity and then taking it away and just having this layer effect of swelling. Again, this is sorta in the realm of, it, of John Cage. Just what, would we deem that music? Are we really, or is it just a process to listen to sound and maybe think about what we are doing with our music, you know, is it just a bunch of swells? Do we have to have pitch to make it more musical? Uh, his per one of his percussion pieces for percussion, it's called Night, but the title has for percussion, perhaps, or so leaves the opportunity is, is this written for percussion? It could be, anyone could perform this piece. And again, just to see that the back of it is a postcard that you could just put a stamp on it and send it off. Uh, his Another, in his last piece, sorry, Maxi Music was written just for um, cymbals and gong as well. And it's, this one's a little bit more improvis improvisatory for the performer. If you notice by all of these pieces, there was no actual musical notation. It was all words. Just like Scratch, the balloon piece that I performed, there was no, you did not have to be, you don't need to know what a quarter note is to de technically play those pieces. Now it probably helps to have some musical sense, some insight as to what you think would sound good and to just have the ear to put yourself into the music. The last piece that I'm playing for you does in fact have a note. Um, it's called Having Never Written a Note for Percussion. Now it's kind of ironic because he does actually on the score write a note for percussion. Um, it's traditionally played on a gong. It is not specified that you have to play it on a gong, but I think in terms of percussion, gong is a really cool instrument because we are able to get a lot of different tones, undertones and overtones just from where we strike on this instrument. And we're used to just hearing it as that one loud crash at the end of a piece, you know, like Mars, if we think about um, Holst we just think of this loud, roaring, you know, object. And so the ability to have a piece that's written just for gong, I think it'll have us all be in tune and kind of listening to really what a gong can be just besides that loud thing at the end. So again, I want to thank everyone for coming out to my presentation. Um, 
I will, I'm glad that you were able to experience percussion kind of in a different light than what we're used to here at Crane, just getting to see kind of the more theatrical, experimental, contemporary, whichever word you want to use it, but maybe different would be the, a good word. Just percussion is not just drum set. It is not just marimba. It is a whole wealth of any instrument that we deem that we could play on. It is so much more than just confined to the repertoire that we have. So I'm going to leave you with my performance of having never written a note for percussion. <laughs>